that go. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for coming out and supporting a great event like this and supporting Book Passage, your local independent bookstore. We really appreciate it. And thanks um, also to those who are joining us from the comforts of their sofas, um, because this is a hybrid event. Uh, which we're happy to be able to have those because not everybody can always come and and our authors can reach friends, family, and fans from across the world that way. So we're really happy about that. Um, as you know, our uh, cafe is open. Feel free to bring drinks and get comfortable here. And um, also later, uh, if you have friends or family that uh, weren't able to make it and they don't know about it being hybrid, we'll have a link available and you can share that. Um, great. This is a very special event. We also like having evening events, especially on nice summer days like this, because it's night, but it's daylight. <laughs> kind of a bonus. Um, and we really love that. Um, and this, I feel like this event um, is a great way kind of leading into our Travel Writers Conference, which starts this weekend. Yes. And you say, how does it invent about underworld about the deep blue sea have to do with uh, traveling. But I think it's traveling. Come on. It's a different type of tra It's the ultimate, maybe next to space. Okay. So I think it's a great way to kind of kick off our long weekend with travel writers and photographers. Some of those events are open to the public. Feel free to join us for that as well. Or if there's a class or something you want to take, just look it up and see if you can still get in. It's not too late. So um, today's uh, book, our featured book, as you can see over there, beautiful book, by the way, is um, The Underworld by Susan Casey. Um, uh, the deep ocean has been a source of wonder and terror in unknown realm and that evoke a singular compelling question. What is down there? We are often unable to answer this for centuries. People believe the deep was a sinister realm of fiendish creatures and deep in deep peril, but now cutting edge technologies allow scientists and explorers to dive miles beneath the surface, and we are beginning to under, understand the strange and the exotic that's in the underworld. Throughout this journey, uh, Susan learned how uh, vital the deep is to, and I'm assuming is throughout the research of this book in your writer's journey and her professional journey, um, how vital the deep is to the future of the planet and how urgent it is that we understand it in a time of increasing threats from climate change, industrial fishing and pollution and the mining companies that are ex also explore, exploring its depths or exploiting maybe. The Underworld is Susan Casey's most beautiful and thrilling book yet. Susan is our premier chronicle, chronicler of the aquatic world. She is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, Voices of the Ocean, The Wave, and The Devil's Teeth, a true story of obsession and survival among American, America's great white sharks. She is the former editor-in-chief of O, the Oprah magazine. She is a National Magazine award-winning journalist whose work has been featured in the Best American Science and Nature Writing, Best American Sports Writing, and many, many more. We're so honored and happy to have her today. Please welcome her to the Book Passage stage. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Um, I used to live in Mill Valley. Uh, a while ago, but it, it feels like coming home always. Um, the biggest challenge that I have, I've learned this on this book tour, is doing this in 40 minutes because the deep ocean is big. And I think the best way to start is just with a video that will give you a sense of the sort of running tour of the deep ocean that we're going to take tonight. We're going to go down to 36,000 feet. So can you play the first video clip? For as long as I can remember, I've been drawn to the ocean. And I've always wondered, what's down there? For as because long as I can remember, I've been drawn to the ocean. 
below the surface, and there I've is always a wondered universe. what's Could down there. Not be because everything that we see so I spent is just the surface. Descending into the depths below the surface, myself. there's a parallel Two. universe. Come back with How could stories anybody that I found not there? be curious? So I spent five years descending into the depths myself to come back with the stories that I found there. There are millions of species we've never seen before. There are three million undiscovered shipwrecks. There's endless lost knowledge, endless future knowledge. So I think Endless that question of about. what's down there has been asked by it's, humans for as long as there have been humans looking out at the ocean and looking at just these vast expanses of blue. Uh, and it's obviously enormous, even from the surface, but everything that we see is just the ceiling <laughs> of, of an immense world. It's very, very hard to wrap our heads around how big it even, even is. But to give you a sense of it, uh, if you think of the Earth as a biosphere, a uh, living space, 2% of that is everything terrestrial, our, where we live, where you know the terrestrial uh, landscapes that we know. 98% of it is ocean, and 95% of that is deep ocean, so uh, b water's below 600 feet. So not only do we live on an ocean planet, we live on a deep ocean planet, and yet it's the realm that we know the least about. Uh, only about 25% of the seafloor has been mapped at high resolution. And if you look at Google Earth, you will see the, the major features of the seafloor, but they're really uh, at very coarse resolution. And every time scientists go out with high resolution sonar and pull, pull the arrays over an area, it's like the Hubble telescope getting the lens put on it. Everything comes into view. They find these enormous geological features that they didn't realize were there. There are hundreds of thousands of active submarine volcanoes. There are enormous, I mean, just enormous uh, landscape features that we have yet to explore. So the, the whole idea of heading out there and trying to see it and descending through the uh, entirety of the water column is, uh, you know, to me, curiosity kind of dictates that. If you want to go see the deep ocean, what I will say is that it is a chance to really to meet the planet for the first time. Because of the 95% of the biosphere that lives in the darkness, um, that's where you will meet it and nowhere else. I, I think if you see marine life and you can name it, you know the name of it, it probably swims in the uppermost layer of the ocean, the sunlight layer. So when asking this question, uh, if you go back, this this is a map called the Carta Marina. It's from 1539, and I decided to start with this because the the prehistory of how people perceive the deep ocean is lost to us. But this map is a kind of a s interesting snapshot, I believe, of the prevailing fears and beliefs about the deep ocean in its era. And of course, what they, people believed was that it was filled with monsters. I mean, how could it not be? They they all they had to go by is the fact that it looked endless. Uh, who knows? Maybe it didn't even have a bottom. Ships would leave and never come back. And what their resource material was was basically mythology and religion, the Leviathan, the Kraken, the Hydra, the Scylla. And of course there would be monsters there. So this map was drawn by a Catholic priest and historian named Olus Magnus, who lived in Sweden and his job was to go around uh, Northern Europe and the Scandinavian countries collecting fees for the church. And he was really interested in finding out more about the ocean. Uh, so he collected stories from the people that he met there and ended up, as well as creating this map, which this is just an inset of it. It's enormous. It's 23 square feet. And uh, there's only two copies of it that you can see. The one I saw was in Uppsala, Sweden, and the other one is in Munich. But so this is an inset, and we've all heard the phrase, here be dragons, and maybe you've seen the drawings of some of these monsters, because these monsters that Magnus drew, these sea monsters, were very influential. They were copied for centuries. Um, there's about 10 of them or 15 of them shown here, and you kind of have to imagine what would 
be going through the head of a medieval villager uh, who has access to the seafront of the Norwegian Sea and sees maybe a sperm whale washed up on the beach. Here's this 50-foot-long animal with six-inch teeth, and it's looking pretty bedraggled, and of course it's a monster. So there's a real like sense of, okay, so they're out there. Let's l know them. And Magnus gave them all names, and uh, the Grampus and the Xiphius and uh, the Sea Orm, which is squeezing a ship. And they're about the size of the Faroe Islands. I mean, they're obviously very large sea monsters. So um, that's one of the things that the deep really specializes in is is having its own lore. And it's we always tended to kind of project our, our fears onto it. Carl Jung called the deep ocean the the analogy for the subconscious mind. It's the stuff that we don't really look at, we don't really know that much about, but we think it's bad. You know, we're much more comfortable with the idea of rocketing upward, expanding our territory, conquering worlds. You know, maybe we'll get another planet or two, we'll colonize them, we'll have more. But descending is a journey into darkness. And it's a journey of submission because at the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean, the, it, the pressure is a, uh, about 16,000 pounds per square inch. And that's equivalent. One, one of the submersible makers did this math for me. Uh, that's equivalent to having 292 se fully loaded and fully fueled 777 stacked on your head. So there is absolutely no way to think that you're conquering anything if you go into the deep ocean, you're there in a very highly engineered machine that has taken all the technology that we can muster to be able to do it. But before we ever uh, went into the deep, there was a sense in the 18th and 19th century of, okay, now we're going to get more serious about the question, what's down there? We've got some scientific tools. We are less likely to believe that it's just filled with mythical monsters. And uh, the first oceanic deep sea expedition that went out it was in 1873 um, out of the UK. It was called the HMS Challenger Expedition. And they were out there for three and a half years. They sailed 70,000 nautical miles. And the whole goal of that expedition was to find out if there was any life at all at the bottom of the ocean. Because the the theory of the day, which lasted an amazingly long time, was that there was nothing at the bottom, that every animal that lived in the ocean clung near the surface because at the bottom it was too cold, the pressure was too immense, there's just, you know, maybe it was sealed by ice. And there was also a sense that maybe the water pressure was so intense that absolutely nothing could even get down there. So if you dropped a weight over the side, depending on how heavy it was, it would just end up suspended somewhere, but it would never reach the bottom. And that really was a hard theory to disprove. So the Challenger expedition went out with uh, dredges, these uh, big sort of trawl net devices with iron jaws on them, dropped them down to the seafloor, dredged up uh, parts of the seafloor and came to the surface and then looked at the animals that were in there and also did soundings where they just drop a line over the edge. And this is a very inexact science. I mean, they dropped a line and then they would have to try to discern when it hit the bottom and then measure it back in fathoms. And the, fath the measurement of a fathom is the length of a man's outstretched arm. So it was a, it, obviously an art to be able to know when it hit the bottom. Um, but they what they did was that they proved that there is life throughout the entire water column. and not just any life, but really intriguingly adapted life, life that we'd never seen before, lots of it um, in no area were, was there a sense of the Azoic theory being true, like maybe there was nothing in some places. There was always much. So the trawling and the dredging went on for quite some time, and it was really labor intensive. Uh, I mean, they just basically spent all day lowering and fathoming back things. Um, but in the 20th century, there started to become a sense of, well, a lot of deep sea animals, when you bring them to the surface, their bodies need the, the pressure to basically maintain their form. They just look like deflated balloons or they were all mangled. And there was a sense of um, dissatisfaction of seeing them this way. 
so the question became, like, how do we actually see them in person? And in 1930, these two men, William Beebe on the left and Otis Barton on the right, became the first humans ever to descend into the deep ocean and and see it for themselves. And you cannot overestimate how risky this was at the time. Um, so I'm just curious, how many people have heard of Beebe? He was a pretty famous guy. He was a um, really popular writer and scientist, naturalist, kind of a bon vivant, swashbuckling dude, um, and had a big fan base. And Otis Barton was uh, younger, slightly younger, and was an engineering student. And BB uh, had decided that he was going to become the first man to study the deep in person. And knowing, had no idea how he was going to do it, but knowing that if he publicized it, he would be able to raise money told the New York Times, I'm going to explore the abyss myself. And of course, it was a headline. And Barton read that and thought, oh, I wanted to be the first man to go into the deep myself. So I'm going to go meet him and ask him if we can do it together. This is a big ask because BB was a celebrity and Barton was an engineering student at, I think, Columbia. Uh, but Barton had money and had engaged a top marine architect to design what they called the bathos the bath bathosphere, this um, five foot diameter steel orb, and they would crawl in through that hole, which was the hatch, and then the outside of the hatch would be sealed with a about a 400 pound piece of metal, and they would sit in there holding their ears as hammers like banged these bolts, and they had three viewports, um, but only two of them had uh, they could see through because their view for, viewport material was basically glass. It was fused quartz, flat plates of glass. And if you know anything about submersibles now, like that's just terrifying because they use like foot thick acrylic um, cone shaped, like they're again, cut out of a sphere uh, that acts like a cork and uh, much thicker, much stronger, much more able to withstand the pressure. And as the vessel goes deeper, this uh, sort of cork shaped window just gets pressed in tighter so there's no chance of leakage but when they took the quartz plates that they were uh had commissioned to put on the bathysphere they put them through a relatively gentle pressure test and three of them were destroyed immediately so the idea of climbing into this and nobody knew like they cocked around the outside of them with white lead paste they tried to do whatever they could but it was really like the idea of being the first to go down there um, they were. They had 300, uh, 3,000 feet of cable. It was like a woven steel cable. It was the first time that was ever even manufactured. So that was attached to a winch on a ship. So of course, if anything had happened to that cable, if it pulled away from the hatch or if it something even if it got tangled, they were done. Um, but the good news is they got really lucky. Every time they had a major accident, it happened to be on a test dive where the sphere was empty. Like the viewports did blow out and the, t the cable did get tangled, but they just didn't happen to be in the sub at that time. So they did end up going um, down into the very top layer of the deep ocean, which is called the twilight zone. And it's from uh, 200 to about 1,000 meters, so about 600 to 3,300 feet. And can you the next slide? And the, Im immediately, uh, what they saw was that far from being a dark void, the twilight zone, I call it the Manhattan of the, of the deep, there are more animals in the twilight zone than there are in the rest of all the other regions of the ocean combined. And 80% of them have bioluminescence. So it's like you're descending into this flashing, twinkling, it, it, uh, like matrix of life. And this is an example of the types of creatures that are down there. This is a viper fish, and you've all seen these absolutely terrifying fish with giant teeth. Well, it's about this big. And you never see them in scale, but you can see its amazing light organs and like the amazing adaptations in its eyes to be able to make the most of uh, the, the light that would be there, which would be bioluminescence. And the um, sort of jail bar teeth, because if you find something to eat in the in the any part of the deep ocean, you need to be able to uh, make sure that it doesn't escape. So that that was what the teeth actually wrap around its head. Um, and there are trillions and quad quadrillions of 
fish. So this is another fish that I find very fascinating. It's an elongated bristlemouth. And I'm just curious, like how many people have heard of it, an elongated bristlemouth? Okay, so the reason why it's amazing that we haven't heard of it, and I hadn't heard of it before I wrote this book, it's the most abundant vertebrate on Earth. There, are, For every human, it's estimated there are about 100,000 bristle mouths. And it, again, is a barracuda in minnow form. It's got these beautiful light organs. It's a predator. It's a little tiny predator. Um, so... There's also the majority of known jellyfish species live in the twilight zone. There are all kinds of smaller microorganisms that you see marine snow. And what you realize when you see it is that a lot of it is alive and darting around. And there are other types of jellies. Um, it's just a, it's, it's, it, it, it isn't the, it isn't space because it's alive, but it, there is a sense of, there's just this traffic of UFOs down there and the jellies in particular have a lot of creativity about how they flash their lights and this kind of bioluminescent signaling is used for mating, for hunting, for just about everything, for making sure that you don't become prey. Um, and one of the other amazing things about the Twilight Zone is that every night trillions of animals that live there ascend through the water column as much as a thousand feet to be able to eat phytoplankton, marine plants, single-celled marine plants that are closer to the surface because they benefit from sunlight. Those types of um, uh, phytoplankton aren't really available in the deep ocean, so they rise and they eat them and they then descend again. And it is the world's largest animal migration. It happens absolutely every night. It, and I kind of compared it to having to climb Mount Everest to eat breakfast these little tiny creatures and they're doing it every day. And what's also amazing about this is that when they go up there and they eat the phytoplankton and they swim it back down, they're taking carbon and they're bringing it down, excreting it, being eaten by other animals that then excrete it. They're sequestering carbon. It ends up sequestered in the seafloor sediments uh, for centuries, um, certainly for years and even centuries for some of it. And it's a biological carbon pump. It's a big part of the reason why the ocean can gulp down our excess carbon uh, emissions. And these little critters gulp down in a year the equivalent of America's total annual emissions. So it's pretty cool, the Twilight Zone. Um, next one. And there's a lot of strategies and a lot of really interesting, this is a glass squid. There's a lot of animals that are transparent. Again, better to hide. There are a lot of animals that are red. And uh, if you dive, you know that when you start to descend, uh, red is the first uh, wavelength on the spectrum that disappears, then orange, then yellow, then green. And so being red is a really good disguise because you're effectively black in an environment that appears completely black. Uh, there are also these other really cool fish that have evolved a special pigment in their skin where they can absorb, or they, they don't reflect any light at all the light down there being bioluminescence, but they can absorb 99.5% of the light that hits them. And so they're ultra black. So they're really just like swimming black holes. And I saw one of these fish and we shone the brightest beams of a submersible on it and it just looks like a fish-shaped hole. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I don't know, this is a pretty famous picture and I'm curious to know if anybody has seen it. This is, yeah, this is the barrel eye fish or the Mac, uh, I, I, I can't remember his Latin name, but you probably think that these are his eyes, these sweet little eyes, little kissy mouth. These are his eyes. And um, so this picture was taken by the scientists at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And they had pulled up barrel eye fish in their nets. And it was, again, one of those things that looked like a, a sad balloon when it came up. So they had no idea what how this fish was functioning, what was what. But what's amazing with, about these eyes is they're inside a transparent head and they can be rotated. The fish can look forward. It can rotate them upwards as it's doing there and see out of the top of its own head. So again, just these amazing adaptations to be able to survive. Um, and a lot of the times, um, since this book has come out, people, when I'm doing an interview, people will say, okay, what's the weirdest thing you've seen? Or what's the creepiest thing you've seen? And I always say, I think they're adorable. 
I really do. They're just, it's nature is so creative. Um, Dr. Seuss could not have come up with this. You know. uh, so this is a little video clip of a dive that I made to the bottom of the Twilight Zone. And um, I'll just play it. It's just, it's very short. your life support doing? You knew I was going to say that. No. Uh, Motors, about 20.5 and it's just a second. Yeah, it's pretty short. But the, the reason I wanted to show it was for two reasons. One is, so we landed at 3,300 feet and we were in what I would have to describe as White Sands National Park. And I don't know what I was expecting, like ooze or brown or something, but it, it just it's like it glows like a swimming pool because the blue light wavelength goes all the way down to, to pretty much 3,000 feet, although we can't see it. Uh, we perceive it as black after about 400 or 500 feet, but it's still there. So when you shine the lights of the sub on it at that depth, that's what you're seeing is this incredibly pure blue. And it, as you descend through that, it is the trippiest sensation I've ever experienced and magnificent just to be floating in pure blue. It, uh, it's narcotic. Um, William Beebe just wrote about it. He wrote and wrote and wrote about it. And I have to say, it felt more like an emotion than a color. Um, it's just, it does something to your head. Uh, and, and when, so then when you turn on the lights and you're on a white bottom, it's like, you're in a Caribbean swimming pool. So that was also really astonishing. Um, and as you can see, can you put the next slide? We were, it, I took this picture, we were in two subs that have plexiglass hulls and uh, the sphere is a very important shape for deep sea exploration. It's the only shape that distributes the pressure symmetrically. So as we saw earlier this summer, do not get into a cylindrical sub. Um, a sphere is the, the shape that it must be. Um, this is the laws of physics. It has nothing to do with us to, wanting to disrupt. If we try to disrupt the deep ocean, uh, we become disrupted. Um, so the plexiglass hulls are really cool, but they can only go about as deep as 6,000 feet. Um, they're great for science. They're great for filmmaking because of the uh, great visibility of them. And um, once you go below 6,000 feet, you need titanium. Mostly it's titanium these days, with, and they have viewports, um, and they're very engineered. Uh, and interestingly enough, they're actually the safest mode of transportation on Earth. The certified class submersibles have never had a fatality for 50 years um, prior to the summer. So uh, the, with, when the scientists go out in these particular, so there's a lot you can see at this depth even. They got the first footage of a giant squid hunting from one of these subs. But I wanted to show this and to tell you about this next slide before I show it. So we went down and then we came back up and uh, there were the two subs were floating in tandem and the pilot said at about 700 meters, okay, we're going to turn off every light and we're even going to put a towel over the control panels. So it's gonna, we're going to be floating in complete darkness. And he said, I'm going to count to three, close your eyes. And on two, the submersibles both flash their lights on and off uh, as the bright lights. And on three, we opened our eyes and all the creatures flashed back. And that doesn't even really do it justice because it was, it was sparks and fireworks. And you get the sense of the depth, the richness and the depth of life and when you think of the enormous scale and scope of the deep ocean, um, it becomes really clear that s light communication, using light as a language, is the most common form of communication on Earth. Uh, and it was really obvious in that moment that there was some sort of communication going on. There was, we flashed, they flashed back. It was a conversation of a sort. and. It, it just, it, I don't know, I felt like I was meeting the earth for the first time. And the only way that you can really do that is on her terms. The total humility when you're in the deep ocean. There are so much, there are things in nature so much greater than we are in the ocean. And to me, that humility is, I think, my favorite part of deep sea exploration. You have to go in with humility. 
Um, you, it's a surrender. It's a submission. It is being allowed access to the the heart, the beating heart of the ocean, and you really feel a presence. It's not empty, and this is certainly evidence that it's not empty. Yeah. So. There are all kinds of extraordinary features in the deep ocean. This is a place that I, a picture that I put on the cover of the book because it was one of the, it was probably the impetus for me wanting to write about the deep ocean when I heard about this particular site. It's called Lost City, and it's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, there are, it, it, it's in a zone of the ocean called the Abyssal Zone, which is 10,000 to about 20,000 feet. And 54% of the planet is covered by waters uh, that are that deep. There is one layer below the abyssal zone, and it's called the Hadal zone, after Hades, the god of the underworld. And the Hadal zone is really interesting because it is where tectonic plates collide. And when they do, um, one plate is driven down beneath another, and you see what's happening with my hands. It forms a deep trench. So one example of this type of trench is the Mariana Trench. Uh, and the Hadal zone accounts for 45% of the depth of the ocean. It's from 6,000 feet down to almost 11,000 feet. It's about 20,000 feet down to about 36,000 feet. But it only occupies 2% of the seafloor, so it's very extreme. Like the Mariana Trench is 44 miles wide and 1,500 miles long. And um, there, there hadn't, until recently, hadn't been much exploration of the Hadal zone, certainly no in-person exploration of it. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, but back to the abyssal zone. So in areas where there is no hadal zone, the um, tectonic plates are colliding on one side and pulling away from each other on the other side. And where they pull apart, magma comes up, microbial life comes up, chemicals, gases, the innards of the earth come up and create fresh seafloor and create a, an incredibly long um, mountain range that encircles the earth like a rift valley with volcanism in it. And it's 40,000 miles long. It's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. It's the largest geological feature on Earth. And it's of really great interest to scientists because it's so dynamic. Um, and one of the scientists said to me, every day on the Mid-Ocean Ridge, there are uh, eruptions happening at supersonic speed. Um, but we d have no idea what, how, how that's affecting the overall uh, sort of chemistry, regulating ability of the ocean. We just, we're not there. We don't see it. Um, so there's drama. There are also large abyssal plains that are, they, they're just an incredible environment, very subtle life. The life in the seafloor extends even a mile beneath the surface because there is an entire microbial universe down there. Um, and about 80% of the microbial biomass on Earth is in the, in the ocean and largely in the deep ocean. So this, this life that we don't see actually is doing... If it wasn't for the microbes, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be able to live here. The, the more you learn about microbes, the more you sort of blown out of your shoes. And uh, I want to come back to that because uh, it circles into something I want to talk about, the seabed. But So this lost city, uh, scientists were out there um, looking at rocks near the mid-ocean ridge that had been thrust up from the mantle. And what happens is when mantle rocks meet seawater, there's a chemical reaction that um, results in calcium carbonate. So these are hydrothermal vents, but they're unlike any other hydrothermal volcanic vents that they had ever seen. Like um, in the video in the beginning, you probably saw the vents with what looks like smoke coming out of them. There are extraordinary ecosystems that we only found out about in 1977. But nobody, scientists were sort of beginning to understand them. They're hot, they're acidic, they have really interesting animals that live there. Um, they don't have anything to do with photosynthesis. They survive as a result of the energy source that comes from within the Earth. So we have the top-down energy source of the sun, the bottom-up energy source of the Earth, and the deep ocean is all about that coming from within energy. And they just came across this place. They named it Lost City because it reminded them of the lost city of Atlantis. It was so beautiful. It had these 200 feet tall white spires made of calcium carbonate. And as they started studying it, they discovered that the chemistry was completely different. It was alkaline. It was cool. 
all the animals that they found there were new species, really unusual. Even the microbes were very unusual. And um, all the animals were transparent and tiny. And uh, we still haven't found another place like th this in the ocean. And it has become a real mecca for um, astrobiologists because they think that it has all the ingredients for a site like this w could have been where life began on Earth. It is the front runner um, for that. And if we find life on the ocean worlds of Europa or Enceladus, it's likely that they will be in systems like this one, albeit obviously we don't know what they are, but Enceladus is venting so strongly that they've captured um, the plumes. They go thousands of miles into space through cracks in its ice, and it is awfully intriguing. It seems to have all the ingredients for life, and uh, I really hope we get to see that. But that's just an example of what's kicking around down there that we don't know about. Um, so this is another sub. This, uh, a lot of the times with nonfiction, it's both the most enervating part of it and the most gratifying part of it is you can write whatever you want in a book proposal about what you think is going to happen, and then it doesn't happen or something else happens, and you sort of have to, you have to go with it. Um, in this particular book, I got really lucky because this submersible, submersible uh, debuted right around the time I was beginning my reporting, and it is the first classed, in other words, certified, safe, regulated, um, highly engineered passenger sub that goes to full ocean depth repeatedly. So it can go to the Mariana Trench every day of the week with a pilot and passenger. And when I heard about this, I immediately reached out because it was thought to be an engineering problem that possibly couldn't even be solved. But it was uh, created by a private individual, a Texas businessman named Victor Vescovo. And Victor is just this incredible adventurer. He was, he'd done everything he could possibly do on Earth. He'd skied to the poles. He'd been to the top of every major mountain. And he was just astonished, not an ocean guy to begin with, just did not understand. Like, okay, why hasn't anybody been to the bottom of all these trenches? So he just, he commissioned a submersible, um, which was not inexpensive. And he also is a very brilliant guy. Um, so he did his homework and got the best submersible manufacturer, the sort of Apple of submersibles, to create this. Uh, it's called the limiting factor. And um, the other thing that Victor did that was amazing was that he brought all the top Hadel scientists with him on a year-long expedition. It actually ended up being four years, but it started out as one year. And these are scientists that spend their entire life studying a realm in the ocean that they have never seen. So he took them down in the sub. He um, also created these landers that are also full ocean depth capable. And they're like, they look like smart cars. They have bait on them. They have all these instruments on them. They have high resolution cameras on them. So they would send the landers down and film what came to the landers. And um, this is a video. So this is a cusk eel, also known as a robust ass fish. Well, watch, watch it. One of the deeper fish. So that's actually a super giant amphipod. There's the, in the Hadal zone, there are all these little critters called amphipods. They look like little crustaceans. But every so often, you get one like this big, and they're usually white. Um, and so the amphipods are eating the bait, and then the cusk eels and others come and eat the amphipods. So um, the, uh, the, the bait is a happening place, actually. Um, uh, next, next slide. And all, all this other stuff happened. So when I got on the ship, I said to the chief scientist, okay, what's the coolest thing you guys have seen so far? And he said, well, have I showed you the gelatinous dog's head that's trailing the tentacles? And I was like, no. Um, and this is what it was. It really looks like a dog head. It's kind of glowing. It, um, nobody had ever seen anything like it. It's a stocked ascidian. Um, and it just very uh, accommodatingly cruised perfectly past the camera. So they had these landers going 24 hours a day at, at every spot that they were at. And you can see a bunch of uh, prawns and dec decapod prawns. And the, these particular prawns, can you see the, the seafloor? Um, they're these round black lumps. Those are called manganese nodules, now rebranded as polymetallic nodules. Uh, the reason that these nodules have become 
important right now is because many people would like to mine the seafloor to get them. And um, it's hard to talk about this, uh, particularly in a sh very short period of time because it's quite complicated, but it, it doesn't, uh, it's not happening yet on any sort of industrial scale, but it looks like it's imminent and it would occur uh, in on the seafloor beneath waters beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and the, it, it would be administrated by um, an organization that was created a, under the Treaty of the Law of the Sea called the International Seabed Authority. And the International Seabed Authority has been corruptly captured by um, mining industry uh, interests and uh, it is a really gnarly situation right now. If it goes forward, it will be the largest extractive industry we've ever done. Each mine that is going to mine nodules will be approximately 30,000 square miles. The entire uh, 2, 000, 2 uh, million square miles of um, uh, seabed between Mexico and Hawaii would be the first place. And if you want to think about what it would be like, it's like clear cutting a forest and taking the top 20 feet of topsoil as well, shooting it three miles up a pipe. Um, the, most of the animals are really small. Um, they live inside the nodules, under the nodules. There are other really subtle, really unusual life forms that live on the nodules. They up the pipe, um, all the microbial life. They would then take the metals, and these nodules have cobalt, nickel, manganese, and iron, but they're, of course, after the cobalt and nickel. Um, and then the sediments, now dead, would be sprayed out at 1,200 meters, so into the bottom of the twilight zone where everybody is signaling with bioluminescence, and um, just create a haze of nodule debris in some of the clearest waters on Earth. So it's really, really devastatingly destructive. Um, all of the reasoning that they uh, have for doing it is false. It won't even replace any terrestrial mining. It will just add like 3% to the world output of cobalt and nickel. And uh, in fact, a lot of EV, it, we're moving away from cobalt and nickel and battery chemistry. So this is just insanity. Uh, and I really think that it's a, a wisdom test and it's about time that we passed one. Uh, it's it, I, I just, you know, it's the biggest carbon sink. The, the, the compounds and microbes that are in these sediments will probably like be the source of wisdom for new pharmaceutical products, new biomaterials, strategies for resilience, understanding what happened on the earth before now. And we don't even know what's down there. So if we ruin it, we will never know what we have lost. Um, so there isn't, just hold the space for this to be completely unacceptable. Um, there's a lot of things in the, in the deep ocean that aren't great. There are some animals that have microplastics embedded so thoroughly into their body that they're hybrid plastic organic creatures, but nothing compares to the devastation that would come from deep sea mining. Um, I wish I could go on, but let's... Okay, so this is another example of something really cool that you would never see unless you had cameras or you were down there. This is a lizard fish. It's a sit and wait predator. They had never seen it move. Look at, it doesn't disturb a grain of sand. It levitates. And the funny thing about it is it sits and sits and sits on the abyssal plane. And when it strikes at prey, it moves so fast that they can't actually photograph it. It moves faster than a bullet. And here's this thing just ballet wafting up there. So this is the kind of thing that gets scientists really excited about the hadal zone and the abyssal zone. Yeah, next slide, please. And this is um, a rat tail, very distant cousin of the cod seen throughout the deep ocean, very curious, fun creatures. But you can see, again, the adaptation of the armoring around the head. Um, like, you have to be prepared if you're going to live in this environment. This is my favorite animal in the deep ocean. Uh, this is a hadal snailfish. So the reason why I love hadal snailfish so much is because they are the deepest fish. They can go to 29,700 feet, and there are no fish below that. They, their cells will implode as well at that depth. If evolution will eventually allow them to get down to 36,000 feet, but not yet. But these guys are shallow fish that evolved over 15 million years to go that deep, and they have absolutely no predators. So you can see they're just having the time of their lives. They eat amphipods. There's, they just suck them down. They're not eating the bait. They're eating the amphipods. 
uh, and they're made of a uh, pink sort of gel. They don't have any body cavities that are closed. They don't have um, a closed skull. They don't have a swim bladder. They don't have anything that could implode in their bodies. They've just evolved. If you take them to the surface, I saw a sample of one. It was in a baggie because they're, they're like peachy goo, but they're so beautiful. They have these fluttery long tails and you can see right into their internal organs and they have these angel wings that are really like, like it looks like a hologram, um, but they're gnarly, they're badass. They eat the amphipods, but if you're made of gel and you eat an amphipod, the amphipod's gonna eat its way out of your head. So the snailfish has evolved a second mouth behind its first mouth, sucks in the amphipod, and then just makes amphipod puree. It's just got it dialed. And what I love the most about this is that here we have the top predator in the harshest environment on Earth, and it's a pink gummy bear. <laughs> I think I have to stop now. Um, what, just one more slide. So I, I'm without giving away the climax of the book, I'll just say I did get to dive in this full ocean depth sub. It was the highlight of my life. It was a, a completely new perspective on the earth, reality, the universe, the cosmos, our place in it, what we're doing. I mean, it, you can get awfully deep when you're deep. So thank you so much. I would love to answer any questions for a few minutes if you, yeah. 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 It is. Okay. So so this is the passenger right here. And these are the, that's the pilot's viewport. That's the passenger's viewport. That's the viewport that looks forward. And then uh, what you, you can't see it so well, but these are blocks of syntactic foam. And syntactic foam is really important because it, what it is, is it, so this is a, like a four ton titanium sphere, three and a half inches thick. And so it, it's very negatively buoyant. And so they put panels of syntactic foam around it. And it also is a sphere because it's tiny little glass microspheres in a, in a like in a sort of matrix of, I think it's epoxy and it's uncrushable. So it's a buoyancy, like offsetting the negative uh, uh, buoyancy with this foam that can withstand the pressure because it too is made up of zillions of little tiny spheres. And then there's a hatch tower. There's an inside hatch on this passenger sphere. It's five feet diameter and you sit in these really cool seats and there's just, it's like spaceship. There's just instruments everywhere. <clears throat> and then there's a tower to another hatch uh, that you climb into the sub. It's just a piece of engineering genius, the sub. Um, and um, what they do is they weight it. So you can see down here, they make these very special ballast bars and uh, they're negatively buoyant as well. So this sub, the way it's shaped is meant to travel very efficiently vertically. Um, it's like a piece of toast in a very deep toaster. And um, so it goes down pretty fast. And then along the bottom, they become ne uh, neutrally buoyant. So they, you know, you can drive around they release a few weights, neutrally buoyant for however long you want to explore the seafloor, and then they release a much bigger weight. They're positively buoyant, go back to the surface. Yeah. Yeah. I have uh, the mic so oh. we can get everything yeah. on. Okay. With Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> With the oxygen in there, uh, is it at atmospheric, our atmospheric land pressure, or are you somehow cha I mean, changing it? Obviously, you don't seem to be spending time coming up to equalize. So no, no, how no. does that Yeah, how does that work, and at w what is the length of the use depending upon the numbers of people inside? Can you show the next slide? There's a picture, I think, that may show the oxygen system. Um, it, you're just, you've got bottles rocked like artillery over your oh you can't see it it's all above our heads um, and it's a completely um, it's a life support system uh, that's completely one atmosphere like if anything changed with that yeah you you wouldn't you're not deco no <laughs> you no yeah all like very very much so Oh, okay. Well, so um, to go to full ocean depth in the Mariana Trench takes four hours of falling. It's almost seven miles. Um, it goes about a meter per second. And as it gets deeper, it goes a little bit slower because the pressure grips the sub a little bit more. And you can feel, not the pressure, but you can feel the, uh, the intensity of the presence of that, all that water. It, it's very serene. But at the same time, it's also very like the word that always just keeps coming to my head is it's just got gravitas, you know? Yeah. 
So I about, about four hours to go back up as well. Yeah. Question over here. Okay, so first of all, this is my favorite of your books, though they're all great, oh, of course. You. And everybody who hasn't read it here should buy one or two and have Susan sign them. Um, uh, this in, guy knows what he's talking about, by the way. He's uh, This is David Helvark from the Blue Frontier Foundation, one of my heroes. And uh, Equal Mente. In <laughs> terms of our planet, there's 8 billion of us. On any given day, there are about 50 million of us out on or around the ocean, which is, you know, 71% of the surface. And then the deep submergence community going down to that other 95%. I'm wondering if you have a sense of how many people, pilots, engineers, company, employees around the world are engaged in the deep submergence community. And what's your perspective on the next few years, how, how quickly it'll grow as we're trying to figure out the carbon and the life cycle yeah. on our planet? Well, so it's a very small, tight-knit community, as you know, I think. It, everybody knows everybody, um, and very collegial and very supportive of one another. And there's absolutely nobody in that world that doesn't want to see more deep submergence vehicles. Um, what's great about a lot of the subs that I'm writing about here is that we can actually go in these subs, uh, as he, uh, we being humans, um, and I think there's a sense of, there, at least there was a sense, that it was going to be all robotic exploration. And yet there's something really, these robots are amazing, uh, really capable. Um, they have fiber optic tethers and all kinds of things they can do with their arms. And uh, they maintain instrumentation on the seafloor. Um, they, you know, they do heavy duty science. But there's, you know, there's something emotional about the connection of actually being there. It just isn't replicable uh, staring at a screen. Um, and yet, the screens are all very useful. There are several organizations that go out with these um, very uh, capable ROVs, and now there's a whole new generation of AUVs, so they don't even need to tether. They just go out there and do what, you know, basically do their route and come back and download a bunch of information. So I think that's what we're going to be seeing more of is a sort of um, a sense of sensors reporting data. And I also really hope that there is going to be potential for people who are interested in going and say even one of the Triton acrylic hold subs to do so. There are only about 20 of those acrylic hold subs um, in operation today. There's only six or seven that could go below 4,000 meters. So it's not that many. And they're mostly for science, but I, th I think that will change. It's an economic thing as well, right? Um, we really do need to understand this right now because the ocean, and particularly the deep ocean, is the engine that runs the climate system. We need to know how this incredibly intricate, very balanced planet all works together because if any of these systems tip, we, especially in 95% of the planet, we are not going to know what to do, how to expect, what to, I mean, we need to understand how our planet works and fast. Um, and the key to that is the deep ocean. So I, yet, as you know, it's really underfunded relative to space exploration. Like, I think um, the statistic that I found was $150 goes to NASA and $1 goes to deep sea exploration and research. So what's great is private individuals coming along, and there are several of them. I mean, Victor spent tens of millions of dollars taking hadal biologists around, and the sh uh, there's there there are several other ships. Um, but it's kind of weird that we have to rely on this. Um, so that I really think has to change, it, and I don't know how to do it other than trying to get people really interested in the deep ocean. Yeah. Susan, Susan, what country? Uh, any? I... Mm -hmm. Um. Well, the the limiting factor submersible is now in Australia. There's a, again a private individual bought it and just handed it over to the chief hadal biologist from Victor's expedition. Um. I mean, there's the, the U.S. Scripps Oceanographic Institution, Woods Hole is renowned, the University of Washington, um, Mbari, uh, the U.S. is fantastic. U.K., um, who else would you say? 
China. Oh, sorry. How could I forget China? China is pouring money into the deep ocean. And there is a reason for that. They want resources. They are pushing deep sea mining ahead stronger than anybody. Yeah. China has got a full ocean depth submersible now. Um, it uh, made its first dive right as I was finishing writing The Underworld. Um, and they also have, I think, a sub that goes to 6,000 meters and another one that they have three deep sea submersibles. The U.S. has one that goes to 6,500 meters. Yeah, so the U.S. Navy and no U.S. Um, research institution has a full ocean depth submersible. Hi. Harry. Um, so uh, I want to ask you about the writing process. So oh. you're obviously like a master of your craft. And given that like between your seven minute NPR segment I heard the other day, if you guys haven't heard, it's incredible. And this hour, like, you know, my mind was blown. And like, how do you, and I know you've done a lot of deep reporting, but how do you, you're in the, you're in the sub, a lot of time in there. I don't know if you're taking notes, if that's possible, but like, how do you emerge, whatever that means, and then write this book? Like, and just sit down and write it. Like, to, and it's a kind of a tricky question. I'm curious, like a little bit of your process. Well, yeah, so about half the process is going out. Maybe it was a little more on this. I, I was actually writing and reporting simultaneously, which I almost never do, but there were things that got delayed because of COVID and problems with submersibles that required me to wait to be able to dive. So I started writing some of the earlier stuff. Um, it took the whole thing. This book took seven years. Um, I think it was because it's such a big topic and I didn't, I wanted to write about all the different layers, all the different sciences. So I actually just crammed a huge amount of information in my head. Um, usually I set out to find scientists that I think are doing really cool work. And then I sort of sidle up to them and talk to them and see if they are articulate about their work and would mind, wouldn't mind if I asked if I could hang out with them for several years. Um, and some of them say yes. So uh, that's what I would do. And, you know, um, I, I really like this Virginia Woolf quote, which is, arrange whatever pieces come your way, which is sort of the modus operandi for nonfiction, because you just don't know. I didn't know about Victor's sub before. I thought in the beginning, in 2017, when I wrote the book proposal, that maybe I would dive in the Titan, because that's what I had heard about it. It didn't exist yet, but that sounds good. So things change, you know, <laughs> things evolve. <laughs> Um, it didn't take me long to figure out that I wouldn't be diving in the Titan. I just had to interview one submersible pilot in 2018 who said, no, you don't. Um, but so uh, a combination of reading, downloading, talking. Um, I record a lot, particularly if someone's really articulate. And then I transcribe all my own tapes, which takes forever. Uh, but I've gotten to the point where I'm a pretty fast typist. But what the reason why I don't use any transcription services is because I feel like when I'm typing it, I'm sort of logging it into my head. It gives me a better familiarity with the, like there's a process of, uh, from hands to database. Um, and uh, and then I will just start. And of course, like everybody else, you know, I, in the beginning it feels awkward. And then by the end of the book, you're in the groove. And you swear, okay, I'm just going to keep going and I won't stop writing. But of course, you know, you do. And you have to do it again. Um, I, I use a system of binders and I... I make a big mess with papers, but I know where everything is. And um, yeah, I have a, an amazing relationship with a, an amazing editor, which really, really helps because even though I'm also an editor, can't edit a book that I'm writing. It's just too big of a forest. You can't see the trees. Yeah. Last question. Hi, thank you very yeah. much. Um, yeah, um, this is a very techie kinds of kind of question, and it goes back to what you're talk talking about with the the carbon sequestration mm -hmm. um, potential of the ocean. I was wondering if you could clarify whatever you you know about that, because my understanding is that when we release carbon, um, uh, you know, greenhouse gases, especially I think just carbon CO2 um, in the air, that it it's basically carbon is forever. It stays in the atmosphere, and the th you know the, our Earth and our planet, including the ocean, takes a very long time to kind of reabsorb that out of the uh, atmosphere. And I was wondering if you could kind of like s tell me if I'm right, if I got that right, and and then distinguish that from what you were saying how those yeah. animals in the ocean are just gulping up the carbon and sequestering. Yeah, it's complicated, and I'm not an organic chemist, but here's the, the you know these are carbon-based life forms, these phytoplankton 
um, marine plants. They're nourished by the sun. They basically are carbon. So when they're taken out of the atmosphere and eaten, excreted, and th it's not that they're going away, they're not, no, no, they still are carbon, but they go to the bottom of the seafloor where they're in the sediments and they're not in the atmosphere. So this is a transfer of carbon from the atmosphere into the ocean. And the ocean absorbs about, um, I think it's 90% of our excess heat and about 30% of our excess carbon. Nobody knows exactly the full mechanism of that. Like if you, are you like a chemist or something or do you know economists? Yeah, well, so there are models for this. They're really complicated. They are really racing to understand the twilight zone because one of the biggest tipping points would be if the ocean can no longer absorb that much carbon and that much heat. Um, and I don't think that there's a sense that it's always going to do that. Um, but yeah, it, if you go to uh, Woods Hole website and look under their Twilight Zone project, you can nerd out on their carbon um, cy cycle drawings and things like that. And we'll explain it probably in a lot more granular detail. Yeah. Well, I think a great um, example of a fantastic event is when people have as many questions afterwards as we had questions answered during. Um, you really sparked our, our intelligence and uh, our sense of adventure. And we want to continue this. You can do it one-on-one -on -one as you get your books and you get them signed by Susan and personalized. And I totally agree with the gentleman who asked the question earlier. Buy one, buy two. Get them all signed, <laughs> right? We're all in agreement. No, it's a fascinating book. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been one of the most unique <laughs> events ever. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, it is travel.